Hello, everyone, and welcome to our new TransTech Milan event. Each month, we bring you curated journeys to explore TransTech, educate and empower those who wish to leverage certain technologies for mental health and emotional well being and human flourishing. Our intent is to discover the personal, professional, and philosophical views of those who create TransTech and bring into fruition for the entire human community to thrive emotionally and mentally. And today we're going to be discussing of the power of the mind, more specifically about certain altered states of consciousness and, and how they can facilitate positive behavior and improve mental health and physical health as well. The word hypnosis connotates a specific uh, psychophysiological state of the mind in which one can be induced by means of hypnotism. Hypnotism is a Greek word that indicates, comes from hypnos, uh, sleep, and osis, uh, that means it's a suffix to connotate the state of being put to sleep. So fascinating. It was popularized in English by a Scottish, um, by, um, I remember being a Scottish uh, um, surgeon um, who tried to um, indicate a specific sub-technique of a bigger technique that was developed by Franz Anton Mesmer and uh, he theorized the existence of a natural energy transference occurring between all animated and inanimated uh, objects. And so hypnosis was derived to, indi to indicate that specific technique derived from an animal magnetism. Nowadays, mesmerism is also considered a synonym with uh, hypnosis. Over the years, irrational narratives have wrapped hypnosis into, you know, or enveloped it into some giving it some mysterious flair. And so today we're here to truly uh, demystify uh, the neuroscience behind hypnosis. And we're going to do this with the, a world-renowned expert in clinical uses of hypnosis, doctors, Dr. David Spiegel, researcher, professor, and director at Stanford Medicine School of Medicine co-founder of Reverie Health that integrates hypnotherapy with Amazon's Alexa. Dr. Spiegel's research of over 40 years has shown that hypnotherapy improves symptoms for a wide range of conditions from chronic pain, chronic pain to anxiety disorders and smoking cessation. His most recent research explores the neuroscience of hypnosis, revealing that hypnosis involves similar brain circuits to those that we use when we are meditating. So fascinating. It's such an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to welcome you. David, benvenuto. I'm so happy to have you here tonight. Grazie mille. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it was a, thank you, a wonderful introduction, and I'm glad to keep listening. Uh, um, and you, you began with a bit of a hypnotic induction too, with that uh, breathing <laughs> exercise. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here, and I'm glad of the interest uh, that you and people at TransTech have. Um, hypnosis, uh, you're right, is, it's interesting. It's the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy. It's the first time that a talking interaction uh, was thought to have therapeutic potential, and yet it has been shrouded in all kinds of uh, mystery. Uh, it began officially with Franz Anton Mesmer, who was a Viennese physician, uh, who decided that he could have strong impacts on patients um, by waving magnetic wands near them. And, and part of the problem that has plagued hypnosis is the phenomenon is fascinating, and that's why it just won't go away. Um, but his explanation for it uh, didn't hold water. And uh, he, however, the, the phenomenon grew in a climate in which there was a need for change. And unfortunately, we still have that need for different reasons. The, the, at the time, um, going to a physician was a rather dangerous thing to do. Um, you may remember, he went, as soon as he got popular in Vienna, he left his wife and family there and moved to Paris. 
Uh, and um, he was very quickly outcompeting French physicians of the day. Now, uh, um, there was a, a story uh, that um, a, a famous French author wrote to his family. We did everything we could to save father's life. We even sent the doctors away. And um, the, if you think about it, if you did a randomized trial in 18th century Paris and sent every other patient to Mesmer or a French doctor, which group of patients would have done better? It, it clearly was Mesmer's simply because they would not have been subjected to bloodletting, which, <laughs> you know, unless you had polycythemia vera or congestive heart failure, um, you were more likely to be killed than to survive if you went to a French physician. So Mesmer competed very well. And something else that was observed about his practice was it was cheerful. French doctor's offices were drab and dull and full of despair. And his was cheerful. And there were lots of patients around talking with one another. So he was able to mobilize the mind and social support to provide encouragement to patients and kept them away from unnecessarily dangerous medical treatments. So for that, for that, he was investigated by a French panel of experts convened by King Louis. Uh, the panel included our own Benjamin Franklin, who uh, was having a good time in Paris at the time, and the brilliant French chemist Lavoisier, who, among other things, discovered you know, the fundamentals of oxygen chemistry and invented the notion of the gross national product within three months of his death by beheading in, at the hands of the French Revolution. So they concluded that animal magnetism was nothing but heated imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think they were right about that. Heated imagination is a powerful thing, but that was the end of Mesmer's career. And it was taken up by people like the Scottish surgeon you mentioned, Esdale, um, who used it in India to provide anesthesia, general anesthesia for amputations at the time. And um, when the, at Mass General Hospital in Boston, uh, ether anesthesia was introduced for the first time, a surgeon strode to the front of the amphitheater and said, gentlemen, this is no humbug to distinguish the ether anesthetic effect from the hypnotic analgesic effect. Well, Esdale said, I'm only getting 80% surgical anesthesia with hypnosis. He's getting 90% with ether, I quit. And so he kind of withdrew his finding. So it's taken us you know, uh, a couple of centuries to rediscover that the brain has some ability to control the body and the perception of pain, anxiety, stress, managed behavior. And it's kind of a shame because it is a valuable, really interesting phenomenon. Wow, wow, thank you for sharing it. Uh, you, seem to say, you seem to say very loud and clearly how the personal trait, you know, matters a lot in designing a perspective and giving shape to a vision. So what is your personal background? And uh, how did you take interest in hypnosis? I'm curious. Well, I was a philosophy major in college and uh, I was very interested in how the mind work, worked. And, um, but I decided that I wanted to learn something about the body and went to medical school. And uh, I took a hypnosis course largely because there is a genetic component to hypnosis in my family. My father was, both my parents were psychiatrists. My father was a combat uh, surgeon in North Africa and had been taught a bit about hypnosis and was using it for pain control and treating acute stress reactions in combat. And so the dinner table conversations were pretty interesting. And I thought, well, I want to learn more about this. So I took a course in it um, and uh, found that I had 99 classmates at medical school who had just read the New England Journal that morning and knew a new drug, you know, to try. And I was the only one who was interested in helping patients control their pain, stop smoking, um, using their minds, not, not just intervening with their bodies. And I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, I like doing that too. But it was an opportunity to help uh, people. I, re I remember a patient at Beth Israel Hospital who had a, a very bad skin disease that was being made worse by the fact that she wouldn't stop smoking. And so the uh, internist treating her said, can you do something about this? So I taught her a self-hypnosis exercise um, focusing on learning to respect and protect your body. Think of your body as if it were your baby. And don't do anything to your body you wouldn't do to your baby. 
<laughs> and for the first time she stopped smoking and her skin disease got better. And the internist said to me, how in the hell did you do that? And just seeing how shocked he was by the outcome kind of gave me encouragement to keep doing it. So I had cases like that um, or I had the thing that really confirmed it for me was uh, when I was on my pediatrics rotation, um, I had a, uh, a patient in status asthmaticus and I could hear the sound of the wheezes down the hall. The nurse was telling me the room number. I didn't need it. And there's a girl bolt upright in bed, 16 year old girl, redhead, struggling for breath, had been unresponsive to subcutaneous epinephrine. And um, I said, do you want to learn a breathing exercise? And she nods. And uh, the next thing they were considering was general anesthesia to, to break the asthma attack. And uh, I said, okay. And I got her hypnotized. And then I realized we hadn't gotten to asthma in my course yet. So I said very cleverly, each breath you take will be a little deeper and a little easier. And within five minutes, she wasn't wheezing anymore. Her mother stopped crying. She stopped wringing her hands. And the... Um, intern came looking for me and I thought he was going to pat me on the back and say, good job, Spiegel. And he said, um, there's been a complaint from the nursing supervisor that you violated a Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. Wow. Now I'm here to tell you that Massachusetts has a lot of weird laws and that is not on the list. And her mother was standing next to me in the room, but they told me that it, what I was doing was dangerous. And that's the interesting thing about these mind-body techniques. People either say they're worthless and ridiculous, give a drug, or they're terribly dangerous. And neither of those things is, is true. But I just said, look, I'm not, as long as she's my patient, I'm not going to tell her something I know is wrong. So um, you can take me off the case if you want. So there was like a three-day argument with the attending and the chief resident and uh, finally, they, they came up with a radical solution to the problem. They said, let's ask the patient. That had never been tried before. And she said, oh, I like this. And she had been hospitalized every month for three months. She had one subsequent hospitalization, went on to study to be a respiratory therapist. And I thought that anything that could help a patient that much, frustrate the head nurse, and violate a non-existent law had to be worth looking into. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, to, to set a proper backdrop, right? Because I was making rep reference to how in years everyone's narrative might have uh, tried to cling a definition, um, proper definition of uh, hypnosis. What is hypnosis? You know, that, like the definitory state of, of it. Sure. Hypnosis is a state of highly focused attention, absorption. You get, it's like getting so caught up in a good movie that you forget you're watching the movie and enter the imagined world, coupled with two other things, dissociation, the ability to put outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. Right now, you folks are having sensations in your bottoms touching the chairs you're sitting on. Hopefully you were not much aware of that until I brought it to your attention. If you were, you can, you can leave now. But we do it, the brain does it naturally. We focus on what we want to focus on and have to put outside of awareness things we could be aware of but are not. It's more extreme in hypnosis. And the third part of it, the part that scares people the most, is, is suggestibility. The idea that um, somebody can talk you into anything they want to talk you into. And it's not true, but there is a truth to it. And that is in a hypnotic state, you're focused on the content more than the context. You're not judging and evaluating your doing. And that allows you to function very well. It's like the state you get in when you're skiing. If you're paying attention to other things, you wind up falling down. You have to focus on what you want to focus on. That means you don't judge and evaluate and compare. And so the hypnotic state can be great for getting people to change their point of view, to do something they didn't think they could do, like reduce or even eliminate perception of pain. Um, but it's got its risk too, in that um, you could fall for something that um, uh, you otherwise might think your way out of. Um, and so it is a combination of absorption, dissociation, and suggestibility. It's a naturally occurring state that most, but not all people can do. Thank you, thank you. In, in many years of uh, research, you know, and also clinical practice, you must have uh, had the, uh, a clear impression or developed a specific idea of uh, why there is so much resistance to hypnotherapy and how this 
um, relates to mystification, you know, and its origins? Well, um, certainly there were a lot of weird things about its origins, and some people think that the magic wand that magicians used was actually also used to focus attention and elicit hypnotic-like phenomena. Mesmer always wore a purple cape, and there was something of the showman about him uh, that is not at all a necessary or useful part of, of doing hypnosis. But I think there's a more fundamental problem, and that is the bottom-up versus the top-down view of what medicine and, and psychiatry are all about. And we, tended, we tend to treat the body uh, and medical problems, as well as psychiatric problems, as something analogous to that of a broken car, that you find the part and you replace it. You know, incision, injection, um, th that you do something. Um, you have to fix a particular neurotransmitter system or fix a part of the body, rather than recognizing that the main evolutionary advantage humans have is their brains. And it's a very complex, interesting control system for the body that we can learn to use better. And that top-down view is something that does not get a lot of respect in general in modern medicine. And you can just follow the money, you know, that, that you get, doctors get paid a whole lot more um, for operating than they do for talking. And, um, you know, that's okay, uh, but it, it is a prejudice against the power of the mind to affect what's happening in the body. And that doesn't mean you just wish things away and they go away but it means that there are ways of using the control system to better manage stress, um, to affect sleep, habit problems, anxiety, pain, um, that are a hell of a lot more effective and safer than chronic opioid use, for example, which is killing hundreds of thousands of people through accidental overdoses in the United States. So um, we need to kind of rebalance things so that we recognize that there is a science of effectively using the brain better to manage the body that we have not fully taken advantage of. Thank you. I was planning to ask you about this question as a being a philosophical approach to, to, to view medicine, but I'm going to ask it to you now. Um, if, should this top-down approach be applied? How could and would the word of medicine change? And how our mental health and emotional well-being could benefit from it? Well, I, there's a tremendous opportunity, and frankly, our patients are kind of ahead of us uh, in that way. That you know, in the United States, about 40% of Americans um, use some kind of integrative or complementary approach to medical care, be it uh, mindfulness or acupuncture or hypnosis, um, um, uh, functional medicine. And uh, they spend more out of pocket for that than they do out of pocket for mainstream medical care. They make more visits to alternative or integrative medicine than they do to mainstream medicine. So there is a tremendous desire among patients to learn means of better controlling their symptoms uh, and their lives. And uh, I think um, the idea of making patients a part of um, the, uh, the sort of medical treatment team rather than being an object to which things are done um, is a powerful model that, that many, many patients want and I think will make healthcare a whole lot uh, safer and more effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, in, uh, in reference to the neuroscience of hypnosis, uh, you seem to indicate that there are brain circuits that are activated or involved for that matter, uh, they are similar to the ones that are activated while we are experiencing meditation. And so my, my question for you is, do you see any similarities between the brain states that we experience in uh, hypnosis vis-a-vis uh, -vis meditation, moving meditation, or uh, dance for that matter? And I'm asking this specifically because not far away from where I am now in Puglia, there is a place where they use... Uh, taranta. Taranta is a form of dance uh, of, uh, that induces trans states, transcendental states by moving the body to the rhythm of tambourines. So what are the differences or the similarities between hypnosis and every other altered state of consciousness that can be developed? I'd be glad to talk about that. You know, it's interesting 
you know, we all love music that the, the typical beat to most songs that people like is about that of the resting heart rate. It's about one, one a second. And there's a reason for that, I'm sure, that, that somehow the coordination between mental and physical experience can be pleasurable and it's something and can induce relaxation. So I think that's something we sort of find ourselves doing. I can maybe, if I can share my screen for a second here, I hope this works. <laughs> uh, let me see here. I hope you're seeing some neuro images there. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we are. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen in doing functional neuroimaging with hypnosis um, is that there is a reduction in activity during hypnotic trance in the anterior cingulate cortex. You see that on the mm -hmm. left there. Yeah. The ACC, so you see the blue um, area of activity is much reduced uh, in the lower image during the hypnotic state. Mm -hmm. The anterior cingulate cortex is part of what we call the salience network. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what we use when we're worried about, you know, two or three things we need to consider doing. Uh, when an air traffic controller sees three planes coming to land in one runway, um, his salience network is firing off trying to figure out how to interfere with that. Um, so the salience network is something that helps us to decide what to pay attention to and what to ignore, but it's a context generator. It tests which context is more important. And in the hypnotic state, we found that people who are hypnotizable have coordination between that region and the dorsal anterior and the, the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of the executive control network. So you coordinate activity between what you want to do and whether you're going to worry about doing something else. And if you reduce that activity, you can engage more fully in what you're paying attention to. So hypnosis involves this highly focused attention, and we can identify it as a change in brain activity. Now, you mentioned mindfulness. Mindfulness seems to involve a different part of the cingulate cortex, the posterior region, sort of on the right. And people have shown that during mindfulness, you reduce activity in the posterior cingulate cortex. Now, that's part of what's called the default mode network. And that's a part of the brain you use when you're not doing anything in particular, but you're just reflecting on yourself. And of course, one of the goals of mindfulness is selflessness, is not to worry about yourself, but to kind of disengage from self-preoccupation and just be more open to thoughts and feelings, let them flow through you and reduce the distinction between yourself and the world. In hypnosis, you have inverse connectivity between the frontal cortex and that posterior cingulate cortex. And that's part of the dissociation in hypnosis. So you can disconnect what you're doing from who you are because you're doing it. You just do it. You don't wonder how you do it or what it means if you do it. And so they are related, but they're not the same thing. Mm. Well, well. And, and, and what about uh, transcendental dance? You know, uh, do you think it's just a matter of uh, rhythm? So. Um, putting uh, the rhythm of the heart and the rhythm of uh, the mind, you know, the different brain uh, states, the different brain waves to be attuned, or what it, might it be? Well, it, it's, hard to do, it's hard to do transcendental dancing in an MRI scanner, so I can't do <laughs> the same kind of evidence. But I have witnessed trance dancing in Bali, which is very impressive. People dance through hot coals and apparently yeah. don't burn their feet or they do this uh, dance where they hold a sword uh, against their throat and uh, while they're in the trance and they don't actually stab themselves with the sword. Um, and it is clearly this sense of complete absorption in the activity. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, it's not you know, sitting quietly and focusing internally, it's connecting the movement with the internal state. And so there clearly is a trance-like activity. I think, I am sure if we could put them in a scanner, we'd find that the salience network activity uh, is reduced, but it's coordinated now with the motor parts of the brain that are, that are coordinating the, the, the juxtaposition of the mental state with the physical state. And so I think it's a way of, you know, there, is, there are different ways you can use verbal cues you can be in a certain kind of environment, which is why we find certain environments restful or stimulating. 
uh, and, and with motion. And so I think one common and very useful way of managing stress is to coordinate your physical activity with your mental activity. I feel better worrying about a problem when I'm on my morning run because the level of physical arousal is matching the mental arousal. And so I think that ability to coordinate mental and physical states has something that that kind of coherence is restful and useful in many cases. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you have utilized hypnotherapy with patients, also with cancer patients or with patients suffering from chronic pain. And uh, some of your research has shown that patients experience better health outcomes when hypnotherapy is used in conjunction uh, with other medical treatments. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about it? Yes, the, um, it has helped us to explore um, sort of the frontiers of mind-body relationships in, in connection with health. Uh, I started a number of decades ago, a randomized clinical trial, doing a combination of supportive expressive group psychotherapy uh, and teaching hypnosis to women with advanced breast cancer. Um, this really came from a sort of philosophical conviction that, um, that confronting non-being, confronting death, which is something that people do in, in meditation as well, can be not just a period of, you know, we can maybe not just reverse decline, but it could be a period of growth where you really come to appreciate the full depth of existence when you're contemplating non-being, when you're contemplating your death. And we thought that if these women talked openly about this, they would be able to help one another. They would discover resources of strength within themselves. They could appreciate in other women what they couldn't fully appreciate in themselves and how they were coping with the disease. And we taught them self-hypnosis to deal with grief, with losses of people in the group, and to control pain. And um, we found uh, that contrary to what other people expected, which is that we demoralize them because they'd see one another die, that they were less anxious and depressed at the end of a year in a randomized clinical trial. Um, and we found in addition that they had half the pain the control group did at the end of the year on the same and very low amounts of medication. The most surprising part of it was that when we followed up on them, 83 of the 86 had died by the time of the follow-up, the women randomized to the support group lived an average of 18 months longer than the control group. Impressive. Um, and the three uh, who were still alive were all in the treatment group. Um, there had, we have since done a meta-analysis uh, looking at the effects of intensive support um, and have found a significant overall effect in 12 studies comparing cancer patients who get strong emotional support with those who don't, uh, a longer survival of an average of about four months, which is typical uh, of married versus unmarried cancer patients in large trials. So social support and training in handling symptoms like this, giving you a sense of control over something you think renders you completely helpless um, can help people not just emotionally and not just in terms of pain control, but potentially in terms of survival time as well. It's no cure for cancer. These women were all getting standard chemotherapy and hormonal therapy as well, uh, but it contributes to better overall outcome. Well, well, very, very impressive. Um, seems to, seems like that unlocking the power of mind uh, for hypnosis seems to bring uh, certainly physical and mental health. But what's the neuroscience behind hypnosis promoting healing, if such thing exists? Well, uh, that's uh, you know an area that still needs a whole lot of um, a lot more research. Uh, certainly, um, there's a lot of wear and tear that goes on in the body um, when we undergo uncontrollable stressors of one kind or another. It affects the endocrine system the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, cortisol in particular, um, and uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. We know, for example, that heart rate variability is a very good measure of parasympathetic tone in particular, the ability to self-soothe. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the one that's in control when you sleep. And that's why you know, a loud noise suddenly gets your heart rate up, your blood pressure up, sympathetic activity goes up, and you wake up. And so the ability to self-soothe allows us to sleep better, which helps to normalize circadian rhythms of cortisol. Uh, and it helps us uh, during the day. And there is, we and others have done studies showing 
that greater heart rate variability, that is the ability of the parasympathetic nervous system to slow the heart and to vary heart rate, uh, is associated with longer survival after a heart attack, and it's associated with predicting longer survival with breast cancer. So this cell, the capacity to self-regulate, to self-soothe, uh, has effects via um, endocrine systems and autonomic nervous systems that can have a positive effect on health. Thank you. Uh, you seem to indicate that there is uh, hypnotizability, uh, such very interesting uh, word to describing how much one can be prone to be hypnotized or not. And is there any correlation with genetics? Um, yes, there is actually. Um, the hypnotizability is a very stable trait. Um, it's as stable as IQ over a 25 year interval. Um, which is very surprising. And it's not correlated with a lot of other psychological traits, except uh, tending to be more easily absorbed in things like movies and novels, um, tending to be more trusting of other people, which is not all that surprising. Uh, so it's a stable trait. We know that it is correlated with functional connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it is, there are a number of studies now that have shown it related to um, uh, the, a, a polymorphism in a gene, several polymorphisms in a gene called for catechol o methyltransferase COMT. That's a gene that, uh, uh, that produces um, a, 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 a protein that metabolizes dopamine uh, in the brain. And uh, we found uh, that low metabolizers, the people with lower COMT activity, turn out to be more highly hypnotizable. And so there are several polymorphisms in the gene that are associated with low versus high hypnotizability. We know that identical twins are more similarly hypnotizable than non-identical twins. And so, yes, there seems to be a no, an understandable neurotransmitter um, uh, genetic trait that is related to hypnotizability. Thank you. Are we less hypnotizable as we grow old? Uh, I, I'm not. Other people may be. <laughs> it's, no, actually, uh, until you really start to lose cognitive function, um, like certain presidents of the United States, um, you, tend, <laughs> uh, you tend not to, uh, you tend to maintain your hypnotic ability. It's, it's related to, you know, obviously the ability to remember instructions and things like that. But um, the only, the only age related change that's big is that most eight year olds are in trances most of the time. Latency age children are highly hypnotizable and some of us lose that ability as we go through adolescence and develop more adult cognitive functioning. Uh, so about a, a quarter of us lose the ability to be hypnotized between the age of eight and 21. But once you get to that point of 20, young adulthood on, your hypnotizability is very stable. Hmm, thank you. Before moving on, on to why you decided to become an entrepreneur after so many years of <laughs> on-field work, uh, I really um, want to ask you, what is the case, uh, perhaps without sharing all the details if you can, that truly epitomizes your work? You know, the case that truly reveals the profound nature of the transformation that you can bring about into, uh, into the world uh, through hypnosis. When you say the case, you mean the, the, the argument for it, you mean? You... No, actually, a, 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 a clinical case, you know, a specific one that could epitomize the nature of your work. Um, well... I had a, a, a pregnant uh, woman who came to me. She'd had chronic disc disease, had lower back pain, and as the pregnancy got worse, um, uh, got not worse, but the baby got bigger, her back pain got worse. And um, they couldn't use medication with her because of the pregnancy. So they implanted a, a nerve stimulator that didn't work and got infected and they had to take it out. And she's suffering more and more. And she came to see me in about the sixth or seventh month. And um, one thing I particularly love about using hypnosis with pain is 
um, that you get immediate feedback. You know, there, there, one of the things that as a, as a psychotherapist, one of the things I particularly love about hypnosis is people get an immediate in vivo experience. They're surprised when I measure their hypnotizability, the left hand is going up in the air and they're saying, what, what's happening here? You know, they get an immediate sort of surprise experience that they can change their body control. But then when you're treating pain, you also get immediate feedback about whether it's going to work. You don't even get that if you prescribe a medication, you know. So this woman, I had her, she, she felt, you know, we take histories usually about what's wrong and what went wrong. I ask always, what goes right? What do you do physically that gives you relief from the pain? And for her, it was taking a warm bath. So I got her hypnotized. She was quite hypnotizable and had her imagine she was taking her bath. And the pain went from a seven to a four, just like that, when she's in the warm water, filter the hurt out of the pain. And she opens her eyes and looks at me and said, why are you the last doctor I get sent to instead of the first? Wow. And so it's those kinds of experiences where in a hurry, you can teach a patient something that surprises them and really helps them. And that's the kind of thing that we can do very quickly and easily. And that's one of the things that led me to uh, to founding Reverie and trying to disseminate uh, this use of hypnosis. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So the natural question is, what made you uh, found Reverie, create Reverie, and uh, to make you know hypnosis more accessible and ubiquitous? Right? Well, uh, sure, uh, Simeone. I, um, you know, I've probably I figure in my career I've used hypnosis with about seven thousand patients and research subjects. That's a lot of people. I'm glad about that. But there are a lot more people that I'll never get to. And I wanted to create a way to, as best as possible, um, mimic the kind of experience a patient would have with me in the office. And there are a lot of, you know, on online recordings of, you know, various kinds of hypnosis treatments. Most of them aren't terrific. A few of them are pretty good, but it's just listening to some canned recording. And so I was at a, a science tech conference a couple of years ago, and in the audience was, a, was an entrepreneur named uh, Ariel Poehler, who started talking with me. And he said, you know, um, there is a way to make it more interactive um, because we've got Alexa now. Uh, and Alexa, you can talk to Alexa, Alexa can talk to you, and uh, Alexa can listen to you all the time, but talk to you sometimes. And, um, you don't need to look at a screen. You know, one of the obstacles to using hypnosis on the, on, you know, the typical electronic communication strategies is you've got to look at a screen that immediately pulls you out of your hypnotic state, but you can just talk and listen. And so uh, we started creating hypnotic scripts in which I ask a question, the patient gives the, an answer and gets a different response back based on the answer they give them. So it's a, a kind of AI kind of um, interaction that allows us to use um, uh, Alexa to have people practice, learn and practice hypnosis. And so Ariel and I have been working on this. We have just founded uh, the company Reverie Health. Um, and we now have um, uh, th uh, three uh, uses up. We have a smoking, uh, stop smoking app. And um, I can show you a bit if I can get this uh, working here. Yeah, thank you. Walk us through. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'll walk you through right. here. Uh, let's see if this is working. You can see that there. Is that working? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. That's so good. we just use Alexa. And um, for pain relief, we actually give people a choice. I teach them to go into a state of self-hypnosis. And they can choose one of four hypnotic experiences, tingling transformation, imagine a sense of cool tingling numbness, filter the hurt out of the pain, or a dissociative technique rather than a sensory alteration technique, where you imagine going somewhere where you feel comfortable, where you'd rather be. Um, a third one, many people with chronic pain in particular get very angry with their own bodies. And so the pain, and uh, my, one of my patients the other day said, I love this image. He said, your pain is like the noisy kid in the classroom. You know, it, mm. it hijacks your attention. You don't have to pay attention to them, but you wind up doing it. So feel, developing a sense of compassion for your body. And then another one people like is a slow liquid, just being able to manipulate the pain and where it is. So imagine that it's moving, that you can do something with it. And so we are finding 
uh, that we can significantly um, reduce uh, pain. Um, patients who have experienced the skills say that it, uh, I like the fact that it's interactive. It's an alternative to pain pills and just laying down. I like the fact that it is taking input from me and giving me a choice as opposed to some other apps that just sort of tell you what to do. And here's what we're seeing over time, um, that we're seeing an average uh, about 20, 25% reduction in pain in people who are using this exercise, using the Alexa app uh, to better manage their pain. And again, no side effects, you know, no problems, no addiction problems. And so we find that that's very helpful. This is another uh, longer term study of pain reduction. So we're, we're seeing patients able to significantly reduce their pain. We have a smoking app as well in which we teach people to focus, as I mentioned before, on learning to treat your body with respect. Uh, and we're finding, we're still doing the longer term follow-up, but we got a 12 month quit rate of 50%, six month quit rate uh, of about 30% which is better than most other uh, stop smoking techniques. And again, no side effects, no medications. Um, and so uh, we're, we're optimistic about uh, the possibility of using this. Um, and um, what I would like to let people know, this is the smoking approach is for my body, smoking's a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. So you focus on what you're for, not what you're against. You know, if I, one of the oldest, uh, uh, things that people with experience with hypnosis say is if you tell someone don't think about purple elephants, you know what they're going to think about. The don't disappear. So instead, you teach people to focus on what they're for, not what they're against. And so we, we consistently get significant reductions and long term reductions in, in smoking as well. So for those who are interested, um, we also have a stress relief app. Um, feeling a sense of floating lightness or buoyancy in your body um, and learning to project pro stress or problems onto an imaginary screen. Picture the stress on one side while you keep your body comfortable and brainstorm solutions on the other side. And people find this a very helpful way to manage stress. So Reverie uh, Health, uh, if anybody is interested, uh, please go to our website, www.reveriehealth.com. And you can have an experience of doing, uh, learning and doing the uh, self-hypnosis uh, for these problems. And we're coming up with an insomnia app that'll be up there soon and one to deal with the loneliness that many of us are dealing with now. So um, we welcome your interest in, in Reverie Health. Wow, we love it. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Um, what, what has the journey of starting a, a tech company been for you? You know, transitioning from a role of... Uh, of a scientist and a researcher and navigating the world of, of a tech entrepreneur? Well, it, it is a brave new world. Um, I, although I have to say, being a professor at Stanford, you know, if you haven't started a company, you just really don't <laughs> count, you know. So uh, it's been kind of fun, actually. And I'm learning a whole new world about how to shift into this. Um, uh, we taught, uh, Ariel and I taught a section of a course in the business school. And so that's a whole new world for me too. Uh, there are a lot of legal papers that I don't fully understand, um, but uh, it's kind of exciting too. And it's, it's, I'm working with some very bright, uh, wonderful people um, uh, in, in, uh, in Reverie who are really smart about making connections in, and testing and evaluating what appeals to people, what doesn't. How do we make connections? Do we do it through patients? Uh, do we do it through um, healthcare uh, providers? Do we uh, do it through insurers? Um, uh, and so we're, we're trying to figure out now what's the best way to get the word out and get people to use this. So uh, it's fun to have a new kind of adventure and to be a, a learner uh, in the field, uh, but doing it to apply what we're, what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah. Um... In, in 2012, you brought your findings to the um, attention of the Dalai Lama, right? And uh, from my perspective, not only that is a, a great experience of uh, trying to create a bridge between two philosophies, two conceptions, two visions of the world, but also that uh, led me to think, well, we have you know, uh, imported, so to speak, meditation from the Eastern countries from the eastern area of the world whereas mm -hmm. hypnosis seems to be something that originated in the western 
hemisphere of the world, if we yeah. want to go with this definition. Do you think those populations could benefit by integrating hypnosis into their own culture? You know, it's a very interesting question, and I think uh, I think it's true. I have to say, it was a uh, we are there is some growing interest now in in Eastern uh, cultures as well uh, in techniques like hypnosis, and I think one of the major differences is that um, you know mindfulness is meant to be a, a new, a different way of being. It's not meant to be solving a problem. So it's very Eastern in that way. You know, you just spend you know in, in mindfulness based stress reduction. Uh, half an hour morning and evening doing it, but you know, and you will find that you think more clearly and you sleep better and maybe you handle your pain better, but that's not the purpose. Hypnosis is very Western in that it's problem focused. So it tends to be rather brief, intensive, and you do it to see if you can control pain, control anxiety, stop smoking. So that sort of Western problem solving approach is the way in which this altered state of consciousness is used. And I, that has advantages and disadvantages, but uh, I do think there is a way to merge those 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 two together. Um, and you know, one example of that, when I had the honor of speaking with uh, the Dalai Lama, um, we were talking, among other things, about these treating these women with breast cancer. And and I asked him, from your point of view, why do you think it might help them rather than hurt them? Um, to see one another die, to deal with death and learn to face it. And he said, uh, I have a very busy travel schedule. And I thought, uh, we're not, you know, communicating here. And his English is very good. And he said, and I, it worries me. And so when I, when I get worried about it, I call my assistant over and ask him what I'm doing for the next three days. And he tells me, he said, that's the way we Buddhists feel about death. We make it familiar and it becomes less frightening. Wow. So he got so it. Powerful. Yeah. So powerful. So um, that, I, I think there is potentially a meeting ground there, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So what do we not know about hypnosis yet? Are there really any caveats? You know, is, this seems to, to paint a beautiful picture of you know, hypnosis also trying to demystify what the past, the narrative stemming from the past might have painted uh, upon it, but are there really any caveats? Well, uh, I, it's, uh, you know, I, I do both. I do psychopharmacology, I, I do hypnosis. Uh, it's safer than any of the pharmacology I do, but it's not, you know, there are, there are obvious risks. Uh, I'd say one of them uh, is that the power, anything that has the power to help has the power to hurt. Um, and um, one of the things that I get, particularly with patients who are highly hypnotizable, is they find that they sometimes are unduly naive and willing to let other people restructure their lives to substitute their needs for, for others. And um, one of the things I teach people, especially those who are very hypnotizable, is beware of the fact that you, it is too easy for you to see things from the other person's point of view, that you can suspend your own critical judgment and get influenced and experienced and uh, in ways that may be hurtful to you. And so it is possible to take advantage of people who um, are willing to shift their perspective and disconnect from their own sense of themselves and what they're doing. And that can be used in a helpful and therapeutic way, but it can also uh, endanger people. And I think it's, it's very important uh, that they do that. I just heard a tragic story on the radio last night about a, a woman whose mother had been killed by her abusive husband, uh, this woman's stepfather. And it was too easy for the mother to think she could manage a situation she really couldn't manage. And um, it's, it's so there are people for whom their hypnotizability becomes a vulnerability. And I think it's important for them to learn about it to see what it's like and how easily it can happen and then to learn to protect themselves. Thank you. Um, and where is your research going with respect to new findings in the, in the world of hypnosis? Uh, I'm collaborating uh, with a colleague, Nolan Williams in our faculty, who's an expert in brain stimulation. And so we have a grant from the National Institute of Health 
to look at the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we've gone from animal magnetism to transcranial magnetic stimulation. <laughs> and we're using these high powered magnets on the surface of the brain to stimulate or inhibit different regions. And we're now um, stimulating the do left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we're studying whether that can actually enhance hypnotizability. And we're, we've got a population of patients with fibromyalgia and we're looking to see whether we can enhance their ability to use hypnosis to control their chronic fibromyalgia pain. So we're now just analyzing the data from, from that study. But I think we're sort of taking it to the next step and saying, okay, if these are the regions involved, and if we can influence these regions as we do when we treat depression with PMS, um, perhaps we can also enhance people's ability uh, to use hypnosis for problems like pain control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you see once the, the, the world will be taken by a storm, by a reverie, do you still think that there will be a role for hypnotists, you know, for the classic practitioner who takes it upon himself to drive people into the journey of transformation? Sure. I think there, there always will be. There's a power in the interpersonal connection uh, that is very important. And part of it is also correctly assessing the problem and having the right strategy to deal with it. And that's a professional skill. And that's why I, I want to, people who are interested in hypnosis to use people who, with good professional training and professional responsibility uh, who can be sophisticated in assessing and helping the patient weave the symptom control with hypnosis with other problems and in dealing with more complex problems like post-traumatic stress disorder where hypnosis can be helpful but it requires a much bigger psychotherapeutic uh, supportive context. Um, so I think, yes, I'm, I'm not doing us out of a job. I, I hope I'm just spreading the wealth. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I would really like to open uh, the floor for questions. Uh, I, I think I seem to see a few of them. Yes, let's, let's start with Fernando, uh, which is the relation and the role of emotions in hypnosis? Is there a way to get self-hypnotized, of course? Yeah. Yes, it, it clearly, all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis. Um, you're just, it's not that I'm doing something to a subject. I'm helping them to explore what their own, to identify what their capacity is and helping them to explore and utilize it. So I immediately teach all my patients self-hypnosis. I now have them record on their voice memo, iPhone, um, the hypnotic experience so they can practice it on their own or just do it by themselves without that. Um, hypnosis uh, can help uncover very strong emotions. I've had people go into very intense emotional states when they relive things that were emotional. If you're highly focused, you're going into a, a particular memory that has strong emotion associated with it, you'll have those emotions. So the emotion regulation system is a part of um, what can be tapped with hypnosis as well. Thank you. Catherine, I'm curious about the connection of ancient and energy practices such as chakra clearing, kundalini, etc., and physical association with glands, for instance, pineal or crown chakra, and the lymphatic system. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Mauro Zapatera? And could you talk more or to hypnosis associated the pineal, thalamus, and gland functions? Great question. Uh, that's a complex question. I'm not particularly familiar with that doctor's work, um, but um, I think certainly the thalamus, you know, it's a deep structure in the brain that has a lot to do with consciousness. And if you have a thalamic infarct, you don't have consciousness anymore. I think it's, and, and the thalamus, you know, I think there's a lot of connection between uh, thalamic and spinal cord centers that have to do with regulation of breathing. There's a lot of interest in now in, and we're doing some research now on breath work and how that can affect autonomic function. Breathing is very interesting because it's right at the edge of conscious and unconscious control. So if you don't think about it, you still breathe or you don't live, but you can consciously regulate it. So that kind of handoff between conscious and unconscious control is very interesting. And I think the thalamus is a part of that too. The pineal gland has more to do with hormonal regulation, melatonin, um, and certainly circadian control, uh, high melatonin levels at night, low in the, during the day, 
uh, or an important part of our rest activity cycle uh, that's very important. And I think many of these Eastern techniques like Kundalini Yoga and others are sort of do the mind changing bottom up rather than top down. I tend to do it by getting people comfortable and having them change the way that they're thinking and feeling. Uh, the other is a bottom up approach where if you move or stay, take certain postures, you will affect what's happening in the brain. And it's not like one is right and one is wrong. I think they're both trying to do something similar, but approaching it from a different point of view. Well, thank you. Uh, what, uh, Stephen Chappell, what about people's aphantasia? That means your mind eye is blind. Your mind eye is blind. What was the first word? F F. And what, what about aphantasia? A p h a n t a s i a. I can I can explain it. So aphantasia, it's a newly um, formed. It's it's newly named. Basically, it's like there's a spectrum where people are like very visual, and there's people that are very low. I lack a mind's eye, so like the purple elephant you talked about, I can't mm -hmm. imagine a purple elephant. Um, and so I've been studying in hypnosis, but a lot of things like guided med visual med meditations, um, I have, I can't walk down the stairs or anything like that. So I was just trying to learn a, a, a self hypnosis techniques that doesn't rely on like a visual aspect. I see. That's interesting. Yeah. Many people, there are, most people can do some of what you're saying, but it is interesting that some people uh, for whatever reason, don't have the ability to visualize. And some of our, much of our induction is visual, but not all of it. So you can imagine feeling, I am having people go somewhere where they're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space, and, and use the somatosensory experience rather than the visual one. And I suspect that the part of your brain that might be devoted to doing that is now devoted to something else. So I suspect you may have better somatosensory or auditory imagery because you don't have much of the visual imagery. And so I would certainly use hypnosis to look for the kind of imagery that works for you the best and develop that rather than try and replace the, the visual. Wonderful. From Brent New, could the issue of suggestibility of lack thereof be a matter of not enough leverage in the client or not enough report from the practitioner rather than a generic issue, since anyone can get into a state of relaxation if they choose to. Well, anyone can get into a state of relaxation, sure, but they can't all be hypnotized. Um, and some people just don't have the ability. And I think, you know, some of it has been, and I emphasize this A, because it's true, and B, because it can quickly turn into a blame the patient kind of thing where you're resisting, you know, you're not, you're not cooperating and all that. And, and that just isn't true. You know, in the Middle Ages, doctors made these potions uh, that, that, you know, were hopefully not harmful, weren't very helpful. And they'd always put in something really awful, like toad bladder or something for the people to eat. And so then when the patient didn't get better, they could say, well, did you eat the concoction that I made for you? And the patient would sheepishly say, no, I didn't. They said, well, how do you expect to get better? So it is a capacity. It's measurable. Some people have it. And if they don't have it, that's fine. There are other ways to use your brain to get help. So it's a matter of identifying it and not blaming the patient for what is just an inability upon some of some people uh, to experience hypnosis. Thank you, thank you. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Do you know the work of Brian Weiss? About, yes. Yeah, what do you think about that work? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, he, he's got some thoughts about uh, contacting people who are no longer among us, past lives and things like that. And um, he's an interesting, provocative thinker, um, but I haven't been contacted yet by anyone in a past life. And I, I have enough trouble figuring out what's going on in this life. Uh, so I'm going to stick with that, I think. <laughs> well, on that note, I think we are satisfied <laughs> with all of your <laughs> feedbacks given. So I very much want to thank you for attending tonight. It's really, really a pleasure. And I'm really happy about the outcome of this get together. I want to thank Paola. I want to thank Alison, who's been so instrumental in putting this together. And most importantly, I want to thank every, each and every one of you. I can see all of your faces. And just let you know that we have eight extra minutes should you want to ask extra questions.
questions. Otherwise, you're all dismissed. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for a great interview. Thank you, Senor. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm curious about like uh, like patients, like cultural backgrounds or whatnot, and and just like self awareness to the various like spiritual dimensions and how that like can translate back in patients like like desires to keep living or desires to like 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 if they had a like a intense psychedelic experience like 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 what are the effects of I don't know the positive effects or what. Of, of that and hypnosis and like self hypnosis like one of the things I've noticed for myself is sometimes I'll notice like some negative self speak or some like factors of myself that I want to like like weed out of myself and I like snap my fingers or I like identify it so just the self awareness aspect of hypnosis I think is more of like self awareness and subconscious aspects of hypnosis that I'm curious about well I think one of the it's a very interesting question and uh, one of the uh, the the things that many different traditions, meditative traditions, hypnosis do is help you to distinguish between a thought or a feeling and a conclusion and a fact. So you may feel negative about yourself or that you know things are not going the way they should or something, but that's a feeling. It's not a conclusion. And the ability to shift mental state can help put that into perspective. And that's something we're seeing, we see with meditation, with hypnosis. We see it now with some of these psychedelic treatments uh, for treatment-resistant depression, for post-traumatic stress disorder, using MDMA and psilocybin. Dying patients are finding that one carefully structured experience with psilocybin uh, actually changes their perspective about their life and death in a way that, that lasts long after they're no longer on, on the psychedelic. So I think... One of the ways, and, and you know, we do it every night when we go to sleep, you know, the same problem that was driving you crazy at 11 o'clock is easily resolved at eight o'clock the next morning if your night's sleep. So the ability to shift mental state is also an ability to shift perspective. And I think that's one of the ways in which hypnosis and many of these other techniques really help us. Oh. I like that. Is there any uh, various like, hypnosis techniques thinking about like shifting a patient's perspective that can cue in like the visual cortex as well like it seems like using like whiteboards and like multiple colors but also like hypnosis like and in, in line because i i've noticed for myself just like how i learn as a visual learner mm -hmm. um and then being able to like integrate some type of hypnosis in that as well just curious Sure, we use we teach people to use a split screen to picture the problem on one side and brainstorm possible solutions on the other while you're keeping your body comfortable. And so absolutely, those kind of visual images can be very helpful in putting things into perspective, getting a little distance from them, put them into perspective and control your somatic reaction to them at the same time. And one more. Sorry. Yes, feel free to ask. It, it's it's your time, actually. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, this and is Catherine. Um, I was putting it in chat just just so you didn't hang up before I had a chance to ask. Uh, sure. Recently, the Transformative Technology uh, Group hosted Thomas Hubel, and I know he's spoken at uh, Harvard Medical School and is associated with other medical schools. I'm um, curious if you know who he is. Mm -hmm. And if so, I have a question related to accessing our subconscious in order to more or less uh, relate um, uh, past trauma, like um, emotional trauma or even subconscious trauma that people aren't so much aware of to, um, uh, to sort of free up uh, associated physical pain in the body. Yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with him and his work, but... Uh... Uh, I have used hypnosis often to go back and help people work through the consequences of, of childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, sexual assault. Uh, and there's no question that, you know, there are powerful uh, mind-body connections that get established by going through trauma uh, that can be worked with with techniques like hypnosis. 
including aspects of traumatic events that people may not consciously remember. So yes, it can be a powerful tool for reaccessing and working through uh, the lasting effects of trauma. Absolutely. Is that, that's not, that would be something like that you really couldn't do on your own though? With reverie, yeah. are you planning to do anything like that with reverie? Uh, not, not yet, because that really is getting this. Is, it's it's moving from being a sort of skill, a kind of stress management skill, uh, into a psychotherapy, and that's much more complex. And so, we may get there sometime, but I'm starting with the easier stuff for now. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, Aaron, you had a question. I was wondering about. Um, like hypnosis and like subliminal messaging and also just like the bucket of words that user, users use as well. Um, just thinking about like how those like intertwine and in, like hypnosis if there's, and like how that can be integrated into these digital technologies. Um, more, more of just thoughts, but curious your thoughts. Well, we're trying to, uh, we're looking at what may work and what doesn't. And we do have certain kinds of images that I use frequently floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space, that there are certain images that just seem to appeal to people and it's easy for them to get and use and benefit from. Uh, but we've still got a lot to learn uh, about what we can disseminate and have people, I, I view the dissemination as teaching people to experience examples and then take it farther for themselves. And so I want to show them that they can do it and how to do it, provide the framework, and then let them explore and discover new terms that are, that are helpful. Okay, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. I think, you. We're, thank I you think we're done. Uh, thank you very much for co-creating this special moment. It was fun. <laughs> the post, <laughs> first edit moment. Sure. <laughs> thank sure. you everyone for being thank here, for co-creating it, for making it special. Sure. Thank you. thank you for arranging it. Take care. Bye, David. Bye, bye, Allison. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs>